recording and um, yeah, we're really ha happy to have you here, John. And I think some of you, I introduced that um, we are having guest lectures on as part of our program, just to kind of highlight the practices in the field and all the different ways that we can create learning environments that heal and empower. So we're really happy to have Dr. John King on, and he is the head of the education department at Southern Oregon University. And he's been on a path of creating a trauma-informed university. So we're really happy to have him here. No, oh, thanks. Yeah. And it's great, you know, I'll, I'll just point out, I mean, the, you know, it, it's wonderful to see the, the learning community that you all have, are created around providing, um, you know, training, but then also uh, collegial support to each other as you engage in this sort of work. I mean, we all know it's, it, it's hard and important work and it takes that, that consistent um, support and presence and guidance through that. So that's really kind of what we've been trying to do uh, at SOU as well. So, you know, for those of you who are in the region, you know that uh, Southern Oregon as a whole has really been working towards becoming a trauma-informed region over about the last five years or so, maybe even a little bit more. So what I'll share with you is kind of the university's uh, foray into that, uh, you know, and how we've tried to go about uh, creating our own community of practice to support that work at the university, uh, our partnerships in with a, a number of community partners to help push that out from the university, uh, and then I thought we'd take a bit of time to, you know, so first of all, we'll look at kind of the organizational level that we're working. And then we'll hone in and get a little bit of taste of the um, the way that we're trying to support individuals practice in that, in, in, in putting that into practice, whether it's within their own classroom or whether they're staff members working in, you know, with students in other contexts. And then we'll just open it up, uh, you know, for, for good conversation and questions around how that you know, connects in with the sort of work that you're doing. Um, so that's kind of the, the plan for the hour that I have at least. And John, if you want me, I downloaded the handouts that you had. I attached them to the to the invite, but I can screen share them if you want me to put them up on the screen. Well, I think, uh, you yeah. know, I, I think those who just kind of form the backdrop of, of what we're doing. So I, I don't think there's necessarily need to do that. Okay. We might, when we get to that second part, where we'll, we'll practice maybe uh, with a couple of the protocols that we've used. So maybe at that point, um, I'll ask you to do that uh, if people don't you know, have access to that themselves. So okay. uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let people kind of drive that if, if that would be helpful. So why don't I just start a little bit with, you know, where uh, the university engaged with this wider community work, probably, you know, as, as many of you know, you know, the, the trauma-informed work within the school settings uh, has, has really been connected in with broader uh, community-wide involvement towards trauma-informed practices. You know, so health and human services, the criminal justice uh, workers, uh, even some of the business community have have um, uh, engaged in in saying, "Oh, this is this sort of work aligns with the sort of collective efforts we're making to uh, promote healthy families, healthy uh, children, healthy families, healthy communities through the." The Southern Oregon Success Umbrella is, is our regional collective impact work. And over about, again, about five, six years ago, that group had, had really adopted uh, ACEs training, adverse childhood experiences, as, as kind of a galvanizing framework to understand, help people across sectors understand the, um, uh, the adversities and the challenges experienced by children and families. Uh, and then pivoted towards trauma-informed practices as a way of, of equipping uh, practitioners in, across a number of settings to help support, uh, you know, students in that. So at the university, we, you know, my role has primarily been uh, within the School of Education initially. Uh, and so, you know, as, as schools were saying, oh, you know, we're engaged in this work here, as a teacher preparation program, we embedded much of that training uh, within our own teacher preparation program so that our graduates are, are going out at least with a base level of awareness about that. About four years ago, we integrated that into our administrator preparation program. So principals and superintendents are coming out 
prepared, aware of, and prepared to help support that uh, within their classrooms. And then about three years ago, we made a we made a um, uh, acknowledgement that you know the impacts of adversity don't stop magically somehow once you hit 18 or reach uh, the university. So we made a, a commitment to instead of just teaching, training people about trauma-informed practices, to start uh, building our own internal capacity throughout the entire university to model and, and employ trauma-informed practices ourselves for the sake of, of our students and our colleagues who are in the university. So we, we've been working on both levels. We certainly haven't abandoned that goal of ensuring that graduates in areas like education, criminal justice, nursing, psychology, counseling, you know, we're embedding that curriculum still within those programs. But what I'll, I'll share today is really that broader uh, university-wide um, uh, professional development process for our own faculty, staff, and administration. Uh, so just real briefly, I, again, I don't know organizationally, you know, how much interest you have in that, uh, but we've started actually working with a number of universities in Scotland, in England, and in New Zealand uh, to say, oh, well, you know, how, how do we go about working on that organizational level? Uh, so I'll just, you know, hit the highlights of that. And that's really what's in, in, um, uh, described in that first document, the, the Trauma-Informed Campus Initiative, which is something that I brought to our uh, governing board and said, hey, look, the, here's the rationale for engaging in this work. Here's what it'll look like. So we invested in getting a team of eight uh, pretty high-level um, institutional representatives to go through a, a fairly extensive training process. It's not quite the, the TIE certification that y'all are doing, but it was kind of a condensed version of that with uh, Rob Anda, who, who's the original um, uh, investigator for the ACES study down in, um, in San Diego, had come up and worked with a team of us um, for initially a two day period. And then, you know, can, we continued our own development over about six months. And we picked people who had, um, and again, the, the document shows kind of the, the range of people, okay. people who were in academic affairs, you know, so uh, department chairs and a couple of departments that we were hoping would be really, um, you know, interested in at the, at, the, at the front edge of that. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a number of administrators, people in charge of academic, of student affairs, who would then be in a position working directly with um, uh, student groups as we rolled that out. And so we wanted people who had credibility and standing to convene uh, groups of faculty and staff uh, uh, that had the power to do that, but then also had, you know, were skillful presenters and that the trauma-informed approach kind of resonated and aligned with their existing commitment. So we didn't want to get people, you know, we weren't trying to convince people that this was worthwhile work for them to engage in. We picked people who were already saying, oh yeah, this, this is important to us. We're, well, we're, we're, we're seeing the value of this. We're already on board. So then as an institution, how do we support and mobilize that, that group of people? So- John, uh, could you give us an example, like what was happening in your, in your university that compelled that? Yeah, well, it, 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 it aligned with or coincided with a period when we were just launching into strategic planning, which was, which was fortuitous. And so, you know, this proposal came out of, uh, went through that regular channel of, of saying, here what we wanted. And really there were three big transformations going on through the university that, uh, one, we started our conversation about being a student-ready campus rather than expecting all students merely to be college-ready. So instead of putting all the onus uh, on students and, and figuring out, well, if they're not successful, it's because they're lacking something or it's all on them, to recognizing that an institution, particularly as a regional institution serving a lot of first-generation college-goers, um, people who you know aren't necessarily um, you know, always academically the cream of the crop and such, that recognizing that student success meant that we as an institution needed to be willing and able to greet students wherever they're at. Um, so that, you know, again, that working in a K-12 setting or in a mental health setting, of course that, you know, you would just assume that, uh, 
you hope you could just assume that and take that for granted. As an institution of higher ed, that's actually a pretty radical notion that we need to be student ready. Uh, and so, you know, fortunately that conversation was always already going afoot. Um, and we also were starting to talk about, and again, this is a pretty radical notion in, in higher ed in some settings. We started talking about student success and student well-being side by side. Um, you know, a lot of universities put a lot of, you know, resources into students. We want to graduate and retain students. Well, recognizing that student well-being that there is, is part and parcel with that. Um, and that also it's a worthwhile goal in and of itself. Um, we want students to thrive while they're on campus. We're not just preparing them for something for the future. Um, and finally, you know, we were starting to really, particularly coming out of the School of Education, we were trying to make the push to help um, shift people, units, and the institution as a whole from, a, we started using equity uh, lens language and started talking about deliberately moving from deficit-based perspectives to asset-based perspectives. What do students uh, come into, even those who need to be student, as we're trying to become more student ready, all of our students are coming in with, with assets, with lived experience that we can leverage and build upon. Again, that, that's you know, been core to how we prepare teachers for K-12 for the, you know, and other settings for the longest time. In higher ed, uh, we haven't always done a real good job of, uh, of living that out. Uh, so it, this, this was an opportunity to really kind of trumpet all three of those commitments and say, hey, here's, here's a really powerful way where we can help translate those from paper commitments to lived ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So within that, then, what, what we'll really focus on what is really number one in this, um, you know, the, the, the document in front of us there, and saying that team of eight trainers, once they were trained, uh, we presented uh, in, in the winter of the, the late winter of that year to our, we have a, a, a key leaders event on campus, uh, chairs and directors of all of our academic units and all of our um, uh, student affairs units, housing, financial aid, you know, those sorts of units all come together. And so we started with the presentation of the, the leaders of those, um, uh, of those groups to, you know, really just share with them. It was, a, it was similar to the trainings that have done around the community. Those of you who are in, you know, up in Central Point or what have you, uh, kind of a two hour presentation. Here's the science of uh, ACEs, of neuroscience, of, of later life outcomes, how that translates. And then here's a brief window in, into uh, um, kind of resilience building strategies that, that help uh, people uh, succeed regardless of that adversity. So after, train, after doing that, uh, we followed up with a survey. Hey, is this of interest? Do you think this, do you find this relevant to your work, to your units? Um, are you interested in, in pursuing further training? And uh, you know, over 95% of the people participating there said yes. So then by that spring, very quickly, we were able to say, okay, well, you know, this team is available to come out and train smaller groups. So it was by invitation. We said, hey, if you're interested in bringing us in, we'll work with your department, with your, uh, with, with your directly with your faculty or staff. And so since that time, we've worked with over 360 uh, faculty and staff across the university in 11 different academic departments, uh, with housing, with uh, financial aid staff, uh, with our advisors, frontline people, um, in really a two-part process, okay? And so first of all, we would come out and in, we'd usually do it in pairs of us in, in our own um, training process, uh, go out and do a two-hour training in a department meeting or a staff meeting or something like that, similar to what we had done with the, um, uh, the, the departmental leadership at that initial period. Then we'd uh, set in motion a period of time where they'd go out and try to implement some, any of the strategies that, um, you know, that were presented in that training. And then at about a six-month window, we'd check back in with them and say, okay, so one, how's it going? What are you doing? Um, and provide an opportunity for them to then 
contribute back their thoughts, strategies, resources, uh, where they are bringing, again, from a strength-based perspective, what are they already doing that maybe they weren't calling trauma-informed prior, but seemed resonant with that sort of work? And then what's that experience to that? So our process has been to try to build a broader community of practice where we're not talking, we don't use the language of professional development, where this initial team comes up and has all the answers when we train people, but it's a professional collaboration process. It's, it's an ongoing spiraling process where we're learning with and from each other, and everybody at every stage is able to contribute to our collective toolkit of approaches of how that, uh, how, how we go about that at the university. Um, so it's really a diffusion model, and the training team and those initial workshops are designed really as catalysts to kick that process into motion. And then we have a number of Electro, we have an electronic repository of trauma-informed practices at a variety of levels that people are able to contribute to. Um, and some of what comes, you know, some of what we'll pivot to here shortly, a number of the protocols for how do we go about supporting people in this work in their own individual settings has, you know, has been collectively, uh, collaboratively designed. And we keep building to that, that toolkit, that set of protocols. Um, uh, and then practicing with that. So the last piece of that organizational piece that we're, we're just going to be getting to this year is similar to the work you all do of, of regular, you know, hopefully will come winter, we'll be having monthly brown bag sessions where people just, whoever has been engaged in this work, come share what you're doing, uh, share some stories, and then we'll collectively practice with those protocols uh, and get more comfortable um, and again build out that toolkit. So kind of a, a, a booster shot for support and renewed um, renewal of that practice through that kind of informal learning community that we're trying to build as well. So let me stop there from that organizational lens and see if, if um, you know, what questions, you know, if, if that's piqued anything in your mind, or if we want to kind of delve more directly now into the kind of the, really what aligns with the work this group is designed to do of, of kind of the reflective supervision and those protocols we're using for people at the university. Sure. Uh, anything else on people's minds that that's questions that have been piqued or? And if people have questions and they haven't introduced themselves yet, just say your name, your role, and where you're where you're at, if you have a question. Any thoughts coming up? Okay. Well, we'll have time at the the end too. So uh, maybe we just pivot to the, the second document and and the the protocols that we're using when we do get people together to say. Um, much, much of this work is at the university has been designed to uh, recognize, again, we're, we're already engaged in, uh, in supporting students through experiences of adversity, trying to build resilience and other capacities within them. Regardless of the language we've been using up until now, uh, this helps provide kind of a common language of vocabulary around of that. Uh, and then starts helping align and scaffold uh, experiences we have at different stages of the university. Um, and as you all know, on a personal level, this takes, this is hard work and it takes a lot of toll. And so we've started working on, and Grant's past district here in Southern Oregon has been kind of a leader in modeling some of that around utilizing uh, resources like the resilient practitioner uh, to say, hey, well, how do we, build people's individual capacity as they engage in this work to help combat things like compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma and such. And I know that's that's a big part of the work you all do too. So why don't we, if we skip to the, the second page of this document, Emily, mm -hmm. and I might just ask us to do a, a you know, a quick little, uh, instead of talking about this, let's experience it a little bit, right? So when we when we get groups together for that follow up session or the monthly brown bag, what we'll often do is ask people to bring in uh, particular problems of practice, experiences from their own lived experience in recent time. So what I'll ask you to do um, 
you know, just on this call is, is to briefly just recall a situation or an interaction you've had recently. Um, and it could be with a student or a colleague, a peer, a family member, if you need be, mm -hmm. but something that, that uh, caused you to feel anxious yourself, that made you feel unsure of yourself or of how to approach that situation. Um, and if you can think of that yourself, name and again if you you know we don't need to share it right here and now but we will we'll come back to actually getting a few examples um what are the names of the people involved what's the setting that you're in are you in a classroom are you in your office are you at home are you somewhere else and to then really sit with for a moment that anxiety and recall and delve into and raise again the thoughts or the feelings that you're grappling with at that moment. Okay, have, have we all got something? This, knowing the work we're engaged with, hopefully this isn't an abstract thing for everybody. Yeah. And ideally it would be, but I, I imagine this isn't a hard thing for people to recall. So, you know, but I, I, I'd ask that we do it concretely rather than just this abstraction, this hypothetical situation, okay? So assuming everybody's been able to do that a little bit, what I'll ask us to do is jump up to this top uh, part of that uh, framework there, the flipping the script. This is probably the, the simplest, most concrete um, tool that we've used uh, with faculty and staff. And to go over to that left-hand side of the column, and to think of in that moment, what could you possibly have done? And maybe it's what you did do. Sometimes it's what you saw others do. But can you imagine responding to that person, to that interaction, to that situation in any way that would actually provoke a sense of fear, isolation, invisibility, shame, blame, stigma? for the person that you're interacting with. And maybe this is hypothetical because maybe you're already past, uh, you know, feeding into that side of, of a dynamic. And we really talk about spiraling situations, right? And it's very easy to spiral downwards, to re-trigger circumstances or people. Uh, particularly when you yourself might be triggered. So at this point, I'm going to ask that we actually make this concrete and, and interactive. So, you know, even without necessarily needing to describe the situation in a whole lot of, of detail, does anyone have anything that you could say, oh, th these are the sorts of actions that practitioners, whether they're classroom teachers or uh, clinicians in other settings, these are the sorts of things that sometimes we slip into that actually might uh, set off and, and, and reinforce this downward spiral of adversity. Can someone share a, an action that, that might promote anything on that left side? An action that we do as practitioners or yes. teachers. What would our response be? that actually simply makes matters worse in the, in the shape of promote, uh, provoking fear, isolation, or any of those other responses in the other person. Um, I'll give an example. Thanks. Uh, I was recently on a school site visit in California and working in a capacity where I'm not in just one classroom, but multiple classrooms sometimes. And we had, um, the earlier class was brought up about shaming and um, if I can't reach the kid then nobody else can reach the kid and we were in hallways of schools and they had some self-calming um, bicycles outside of classrooms and one young boy had his um, sweatshirt hoodie on covered his face and we were kind of walking in and out of classrooms and when we were debriefing later one teacher had mentioned well that kid was out there for we were there for 20 or 30 minutes and no adult ever checked on him and kind of, they were doing the blame and shame and I interjected with a comment or a remark that was, you know, I, I don't know how many 
teachers actually really want to do intentional harm to kids. But I think is we as educators need to stop and ask that question of like, what, what's the technique? What's the purpose? Tell me about the kid. And the room went quiet. <laughs> mm -hmm. 14 of us. Um, and I'm not sure if I isolated them or instilled some fear, but I was trying to move away from, you know, is that an assumption or is that an actual fact? Know that they, the kid, the teacher just stuck the kid in the hallway to get him out of the classroom because they didn't want to deal with it. Or do you know, I mean, did you have a conversation with the student? So I just, I deal with a lot of assumptions and, and I try to speak the truth, but I don't know sometimes if I mm -hmm. speak, if it's harming. Yeah, this is, it's, it's a really interesting dynamic recognizing people in different roles, right? Oftentimes when we're working with frontline faculty or staff, in this sort of conversation, our focus is on, well, what could you, what are the responses that people are having and reactions to the students themselves that are promoting fear, isolation, shame, or blame for the student, right? But then also recognizing, well, for those of us who are in, in a supervisory capacity or as a trainer and working with the faculty staff themselves, you know, we can also provoke these responses for the adults that we're working with, right? For the faculty of the staff and, and setting off that exactly that same dynamic that we're looking at uh, and trying to be cognizant of how we interact with students and our the impact of our responses and reactions on them. So often we forget, and this is you, you know, you obviously didn't, that's wonderful, to ask exactly those same questions as we're dealing with uh, the adults in this process as well. Um, so could I ask, and, and so, and maybe the rest of us just, uh, use this as a thought experiment, right? And so we're working with, I'll go back and maybe it's a little bit more concrete and easier to deal with the student in the hoodie, right? Who I can picture, and maybe this is my projection, a student in a hoodie who seems very disengaged, who shut down, who, uh, is maybe even actively resistant to something that uh, as a teacher or as, as, as somebody, as a therapist or something who's trying to pull them in and you meet this wall of, uh, of opaque silence or resistance, okay? Let's all grapple with that for a moment. And if we could all just take one thought experiment to offer one way of potentially responding to that student, of engaging that student in that moment, that sets us off on that left-hand column, right? What's one thing we could do that might increase that student's sense of isolation? Sorry, cut out for a minute. To increase their sense of isolation or decrease? Right, so that we're, we're actually, we're now, we're gonna sit with one more time on this left-hand column. Our responses, our reaction to a student that actually exacerbates their experience of adversity in that moment. What could that possibly look like? Well, so Meryl, I'll put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, lecturing, sending them down to in-school detention. Okay. Um, making assumptions. Yeah. Not yep. collaborating. Okay, Becky, anything else? Yeah, uh, just basically giving them a feeling of, of shame and um, telling them that, you know, that's not the thing to do here. That's not the rules and, you know, that's tone not of voice. Okay, yeah. Um, you know. Jackie? I don't know, I'm wondering, cause you know, the, the young man, he was on a stationary bike. Um, and I don't, I think it was a K through eight school and I think he was upper intermediate maybe middle school and I wondered if you know the eight of us that were in the hallway we didn't engage with the student we just kept walking and I don't know if that could have had an impact on the student and there were some assumptions of oh he's probably on the spectrum or oh okay uh, so, so I, I could, yeah I could see that potentially increase, particularly if he is on the sense of spectrum, mm -hmm. maybe a sense of invisibility. Oh, we yeah. see we're going to walk right by this kid potentially in crisis. I could also see it potentially replicating unproductive patterns. 
oh, you know what? Maybe, you know, maybe the kid's not on the spectrum, even if he is. It's like, well, we're going to ignore this problematic behavior because it makes our life that much harder to engage with. And so for our own sake and our own comfort, we're just going to pretend we don't see that and go on because uh, it's going to it's going to bring me up short and it's going to have to make me deal with some of my own discomfort in that moment. Or maybe it's just more time and work when I'd rather be focused on the kids who are doing what I want them to do. Right. So yeah. Roxy, Bonnie, Shannon, anything else in that, you know, that, that you can picture off that left hand column? Um, I was thinking even just just the question we use when we engage the kiddo saying like, you know, why are you out here? Just even the tone that we mm -hmm. use when we're speaking. Yeah. So I guess, you know, just for the, so we would sit with this a while, right? But basically the point is one, this isn't hard to do. <laughs> it's pretty easy and oftentimes it's very habitual to slip into, we almost go to automatic routine some cases. And it's really sometimes pretty tempting to even inadvertently slip into that downward spiral and making things worse. Sometimes we do it intentionally. Sometimes, if, particularly if we're angered by or, or taking it personally or, or feeling resentful towards that student, oh, here you go again, right? And so sometimes, you know, so that, that's a pretty easy suck over to uh, kind of a downward spiral. Fortunately, we're all well-meaning people and we're all professionals and we've all had some training over here. So it's also probably pretty simple for us to say, oh, well, let's jump over to the right-hand column, right? If we're actually looking to use this as a teachable moment, an opportunity for connection or healing, what would it look like to try to provoke any of those feelings or experiences for the student associated with over on the right side that actually starts building resilience, connection, healing. So I'll do exactly the same thing. Kid in the hoodie, you're in the hall, in the classroom, seems this black opaque, you know, uh, resentment emanating from him. What's at our disposal? What would an action be that any of us could take to move us over onto the right side? Well, one thing, I mean, I noticed is obviously if he was out, well, I won't say obviously, but he was out in the hallway on his own, riding the bike as probably, hopefully it was a form of choice or um, a way that somehow the teacher and the student built a, a structure or a format for him to, you know, if he is flipping his lid or not able to self-regulate that that bicycle was a place for him to where he could, you know, deregulate. Yeah. Um, I think part of us, because we were guests, um, maybe ne may have not have said anything because we wouldn't have wanted to trigger behavior. But I'm wondering if we had known the student, if we could have said, you know, use the student's name with a positive comment or, um, and if he was on the spectrum, you know, maybe was there a time, you know, a, a clock involved um, to help with the self-regulation, again, based on student choice. Okay. Like, yeah, so validating that choice and 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 wrecking and deciding to frame it in an asset based rather than a deficit based perspective. Hey, it's possible. <laughs> it's possible that this student is actually doing this as a conscious choice to help get himself regulated. That the teacher has or the school has set up this system to support that, and he's going to come back and join us when he's ready. Heck of a lot better that than flipping a table and running out, right? Mm -hmm. A good choice. I'd like to know more about how the student moves from the classroom to the bicycle. And if that's something the faculty um, has agreed upon is like a common agreement or in mm -hmm. a particular class. Okay. So not knowing that at this point, how about the rest of us? What, what are other, just given this generic, this general situation where we don't know a lot perhaps of that background, what are other things that we could you know, that a teacher or, or an adult in that situation can do to promote that student feeling welcomed, feeling safe, feeling accepted. Now I try to make eye contact, and, and, you know, with my face and smile. And, and if it is, we don't know the situation. So if the person's nonverbal, like giving a thumb, like, how are you doing? Are you doing okay? Like kind of giving a thumbs up so they can respond either to the hand signal or just 
verbally or not. I think okay. it's a long yeah. way. Shannon or Eileen, anything on your, on your mind there? I think even just having like an adult, even if they're not ready to talk or maybe they can't talk, um, just having like an adult out there in the hallway, um, like a program assistant or I don't know if they have like another preferred adult. Um, Cause like I said, that they were out there by themselves. Mm -hmm. So maybe they don't, you know, they're not in that, in that moment to discuss what's happening and they just need to be there. But the adult could be still just standing somewhere near where they know someone is close mm -hmm. um, or even like on the other side of the hallway um, and they don't have to be engaging, but they're still kind of having that belonging and connection that, hey, someone is here with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just be worried about like a kid out there by themselves. You know, what if he gets up and just walks away somewhere and goes somewhere else in the building? Um, so I think like that's something that I think sometimes when a kid is like in a in a in a moment where you want to like talk about it really quick, but like giving them that time that he just needs to be on the bike, but I'm still here close by yeah. for when they're ready. And it's it's easy to imagine a lot of ways where that kid disappears and we provide the sense of, well, do we even notice that you're gone? Do we care that you're gone? Mm -hmm. Or is the door still open for you to come back and join us when you're, when you're ready, right? And so all of those men, hey, we notice that you're gone. We care that you're gone. We value the choice. We're not going to jump on you right now, jump back in when you're not ready. But by the way, the door is open when you're ready. I'm here. I'm still here for you. Uh, so that, that relational aspect of that is still... You know, we can do a whole lot of very subtle or overt things to, to convey that, that that connection is and that that door is still open when that student's ready. OK, so again, we could we could go down this list and sometimes we'll actually go bullet by bullet. What is something a concrete action that helps that student feel seen? What's a concrete action that that is focused on their strengths? What's a concrete action that might build a sense of confidence or control? Right. All the way down that. So. Given the time we have, though, one another recognition that this wasn't hard to come up with these possibilities, right? I mean, we, we, we could each go down that list and name 10, 20 different actions we could take to help build the upward spiral towards resilience, okay? So acknowledging that, why is it sometimes so easy to get sucked back over into that left hand. If we can all name everything on that right hand column, why the heck aren't we doing it every single time, every single day? And that's not a judgmental question. That's a very authentic question. What makes it hard for us consistently to live in the resilience column? We just had a great discussion on this in a course about our brain is wired, like our connections are deeply wired from experience. And we live in a culture that that is embedded in those in those strategies of adversity, right? Like mm -hmm. isolation and shame to deal with behavior. Even if we know better, even if we know we should respond in another way, it takes a lot of conscious action and energy to to rewire your brain and change your reactions when all of your experiences, witnessing how kids were treated in school as a child, witness, you know, your own parenting exper experiences being parented. If they're embedded in that adversity column, even if we know better, we'll often go back to that column because it's our, it's the most common experience, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Are there other thoughts on it by anyone else? I, I think a lot about the, like the pressure that's put on teachers nowadays and yeah. I um, I think like sometimes this work can feel like one more thing and um, I don't know I mean I think we're, like this situation with the, the student that Jackie brought brought up really makes me think a lot about um, universal um, responses and supports and like I had a situation that was similar in kindergarten with with our, our specialist team went out and um, this kid would not leave the room to do the movement breaks that were on his IEP and the teacher is doing her very best she's having a conscious you know a conscious um, response to his behavior at least when we were there 
but you know, like, why aren't these things universal responses so that the ki- that it's not <laughs> so much on the teacher to always have mm-hmm. to carry the load? <laughs> yeah. And I think that, so thank you. I mean, I think that's a key thing. And that's for me now as an administrator coming in here, right? This choice between which column to work on is not solely an individual choice, Yeah. right? There's a lot of structural and organizational things we do to push adults back over into that left hand to make that the easier response in some ways, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and, and some of it is individual, right? I mean, it's a lot easier to work on the right hand column to respond and react on that level. First period, first thing in the morning. What about by the end of the day when you've done this, you know, this is your 40th interaction now and holy smokes, what, you know, that, that personal well of, of your own personal resilience uh, to draw upon. It's hard work. Mm-hmm. There's stuff I, I'd venture if we, that some of what pulls us over to, you know, the left-hand column also goes back to that very first question I asked you here. If we go back to your own faced in that circumstances, what are your thoughts and emotions and feelings going on in that moment, Mm -hmm. right? Oftentimes it's uh, exasperation. Oftentimes it's resent. Oftentimes it becomes about me, right? Mm -hmm. You're making my, you're as a student, you're, you're communicating some sense of adversity or crisis or need for me, but holy smokes, you're making my life harder right now. Mm -hmm. And, and so working off of that impulse. And so oftentimes that's where, you know, we, we would move down into this kind of the elevator, the second um, protocol down there to really work on our own uh, individual responses of moving from our head to our heart, to our gut, you know, it, what, what's, what are my own, uh, you know, reactions in that moment that might be prompting me to one direction or the other how do I name that, recognize, and then create space for myself? Again, even if it's a two, three second, hey, I'm not going to respond right now. I'm going to give myself the time to move over and be conscious and intentional about working off the right-hand column rather than slipping intend, uh, reactively over to the, the left-hand column, right? Oftentimes, we're better at giving students that space. Mm-hmm. Hey. He needs to go out into, he's, you know, his amygdala is flipped, right? He needs to go out and ride the bicycle for a couple of minutes before coming back in. How the heck do we give teachers or clinicians permission to ride their bike when they got 30 or 40 or 50 kids in front of them? What does that look like, mm-hmm. right? And so on an institutional and an organizational level, that's the sort of stuff we need to be grappling with as well and not just expecting and burdening all frontline people to deal with this in and of themselves, right? There's a, you know, and so we, we have, we're developing that toolkit as well. One of the wonderful examples that I love, I, you know, just uh, uh, next weekend, I'm actually going over to the nursing program and doing a workshop with them. And one of the, uh, you know, collective, uh, you know, responses that have come up in the past from that program in terms of their own uh, toolkit for resilience comes from Providence and Providence nurses, um, at least in, in, in a couple of facilities, have started wearing uh, the lavender badges. Is, is that meaningful to anyone here? So a lavender badge is something uh, a frontline clinician can, can wear that says, you know what, today mm-hmm. is not the day to put me right in a critical moment. Or, you know, for these 10 minutes, I'm going to wear my lavender badge and I'm, I'm, I'm signaling just like we would let kids signal, you know, a, a red, green or, you know, yellow card where I'm at at this point. A lavender badge allows staff to communicate in subtle, powerful ways. And they've created an institutional culture that others recognize what that means, respect that choice. And okay, I'm not going, you know, for this, while that badge is displayed, I recognize if there's something really critical or anxiety producing, I might ask somebody else rather than you at this moment, right? So all sorts of real institutional type of of shifts can happen once this becomes acknowledged uh, 
that there's an institutional obligation to support this. It's not just individuals who need to be trauma informed. Okay. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm just going to leave, you know, leave, leave my, the presentation piece behind here a little bit. Uh, there's a whole, you know, we, we practice all sorts of these sorts of protocols at different times in different ways. We're building it to it all the, the time. Uh, and we're looking to help promote individual as well as organizational level uh, development along these ways. So why don't I stop talking, uh, open it up for questions and conversation and see where you wanna, where people are interested in taking any of this. Thanks, John. And John, did you create this document that's up here? Is yes. It, yeah, yeah, it's not cited, so I will cite you. No, it's, I, a, I it, use it. it's it, awesome. Yeah. So there are pieces, so actually before, so the, these are pieces that have been adapted from different places. So before this goes, so the trauma-informed questions, actually the, what we're seeing down there are adapted from Ken Ginsburg's work, Resilience in Action, uh, or Reaching Teens that certain uh, districts around here have started taking. The Promoting Resilience in the in Elevator uh, model is adapted from some work of Fred Korthagen, uh, around core reflection that we use in, in uh, the education department. Now, it's not, Fred's work is not promoted, focused on the resilience side of it. It's, it's just that, that notion of moving up and down from you know, head to heart to gut and that sort of thing. So a lot of this has been, you know, there are frameworks that we're using and then adapting to those purposes. So before we publish anything, you know, that'll, you know, just just be aware of that. So this okay. is not ready for public consumption yet at the, in that way. Okay, I did put the documents just in the the invite for this. Okay, class. exactly, and, and that's we've that. got. Yeah, that that's okay. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. So, do people have? We have ten more minutes. Do people have questions for John? I know Bonnie, you work in. You're a professor in the University of Arkansas. Yes. So, um, you know, we've got people in higher ed on the call. So any questions about changing systems, you know, systems level change? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and talk. I don't know if you all saw the recent um, media blurb that went out that Arkansas is one of the highest or the highest with ACEs in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like this is just a ripe area for me to help our university become trauma informed. I'm taking all the notes I can. Um, I have a meeting with our college council. So our college that I'm part of in the university is College of Education and Health Professions. So we're one college. And I think that's a great unifying place for this to land. And so I have a meeting December 4th with college council. And they already said, we want this to be about SEL, social emotional learning, but I have faculty members in teacher preparation. I'm sorry to say this out loud, but they have heard of it specifically. So I feel like I'm having- I missed that. I think you cut out for one second. You have I'm in the, I'm, my particular program is kindergarten through sixth grade teacher licensure for education um, preparation program. But I have people that I work with that haven't even heard of ACEs. Like, have, like when I say ACEs, they're like, what did you say? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I feel like this, I just wanna get as much information as I can out in a place that's that they can, you know, work with. And so I'm, I'm a little bit overwhelmed, but at the same time, just very hopeful. I'm just not sure where to start, I guess. Um, well, I'll just reflect back, uh, Bonnie, that that's exactly where we were five years ago, right? Um, and, and it was, you know, the university was playing catch up to the region in that it was our K-12 uh, partners and our health and human service providers uh, who had really brought in trauma awareness into the valley. And it was only because we were responding to the conversations that were already taking place in K-12 schools that we figured, oh, well, we, we better, you know, start get embedding this within our own work. And then it grew from there within the university. The one for, in a higher ed setting, um, particularly when you're working with you know, your council or something like that, one resource I'd throw out there is actually the Resilience Consortium. Uh, and that's an organization, a virtual body that um, 
started out again about five years ago up in the um, uh, with the Ivy League universities where they recognize, oh, our students are coming and experience a lot more emotional distress and anxiety than we used to think of. Mm -hmm. And so they started getting together and thinking about that and making sense of it and then building out uh, supports and services for, for their own students. That body has now grown across the country. Uh, so you, last year I joined that for at Broadour University and they have a, both some conferences, but then also a great electronic repository of both research, uh, assessments, uh, protocols, and resources there. So the resilience can, so, I think it's actually promoting academic resilience in higher education, but it's, it's grown a lot larger than that and has actually been a really good tool for us uh, to contribute to and also draw upon. You're not alone in that experience. Any other questions for John? I have one just, it's, I think it's on topic, but um, I was wondering if you ever in this work, I know that a lot of your work is with, with staff and teachers, but do you ever talk about like physical spaces of schools and classrooms and I, I keep wondering about like in here in rural Southern Oregon that just keeps coming up like how sometimes it's like we have all of the best intentions and the te and the staff is really trained, but there's like this energy kind of hanging over this building that's falling apart or I don't know if that's yeah. a, that ever comes up or if you even focus on that at all. You know, working within the universe, I mean, we do, you know, with, with our protocols, particularly in teacher training, I mean, we, the learning environment analysis and things like that, I mean, there, there's that element. Where this has come up at the university level with our own students on campus is really around things like circle pedagogy, right? Uh, of saying, okay, well, we need to, you know, as we're working with the physics department for crying out loud or something like that, we need spaces that allow different configurations and, and like convey different connections and pedagogies and such. And so really over the last uh, three years, we've, we've been battling and, and actually now have five uh, rooms on on an entire university campus. I know this isn't going to sound like much, but we have five rooms that are dedicated for circle pedagogy. So there are the, some of the bigger rooms, and there are individual desks rather than you know these long tables. And you know, just something like that is is our one little acknowledgement along those ways. And so that the default isn't when you get in, uh, everything's in rows, and you got to put them back in rows when you're done. This is flipping that, right? And saying, no, this, this, this connectedness is, is the default and the norm and anything other than that, you've got to make the exception. Um, you know, so that's, that's been our little uh, nod to that. Amanda, I was thinking about this, I don't know if this is it either, but thinking about, or actually calling rethinking the faculty lounge, because you know, a lot of places, we think yeah. now, like, you avoid that because it's really, pretty. it could be toxic in there. And so I've really been thinking about that because, you know, I feel like flexible seating is taking over in our, our area of Arkansas and those kinds of things, spaces and calm corners. We need that for our teachers. We need calm corners for our teachers with stationary bikes or whatever um, in faculty lounges. So that's just something I've been thinking. Yeah. I totally agree, Bonnie, that, like, if we want adults to yep. provide support for kids, we need to model it for the adults. Exactly. Kind of what supervision is about, right? You're modeling that healthy relationship that they'll pass on to others. But you're right, if we give them a safe, calm space and they see how transformational it is, mm -hmm. they'll be more willing to provide that for children. Exactly. Yeah. One thing I, I just like to throw out too is it, I, I even brought, I mean, the idea of modeling is 100%, right? Everything we do is modeling. And so beyond even physical space, it's, it's our space, our time together. So our biggest effort in ed has been a shift on how we spend our time together when we get together as faculty and staff. And so our department meetings, for example, always start with 15 minutes of sharing our work. Not of announcements, not of this change or that change, but of, of putting somebody front and center and say, oh, what are you working on right now that you care about? And it could be curricular, it could be, you know, it could be anything. But to start our time together with our own sense of connection and visibility, because again, what we're sharing our work is oftentimes what we're sharing is the stuff that remains invisible to each other. 
and where we feel isolated and don't feel valid. So to say we're, we're prioritizing that connectedness among our faculty about the things our faculty care about that are dear to their hearts, that's where we're going to start our time together. So that that has been a big shift we've done over the last about, we're about three years into that now. And it, the tone that it shifts in our own culture and climate among the adults, the professionals in, 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 the, in the institution, that's been key. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, John. This was so valuable and it's great to hear more in depth about the work you're doing at SOU. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Is well, there a way? You. Oh, good. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm gonna thank you for the invitation and I'll also say, hey, my hope is, again, this has been an opening for us, right? And so Bonnie, you know, as you guys are moving forward in Arkansas, the rest of you are in your own settings. My hope is that, again, that we're now, you know, that I can be part of that community practice and learn from you as well as support that work. And that's what we've been building. You know, again, I, I started talking about the institutions over in uh, uh, in the UK that we're working with. Uh, higher ed is the last bastion where we're slow to the game. And particularly so those of us who are working in that setting, the opportunity to learn with and from each other and to draw upon a lot of the great work that's happening K-12 or in, you know, mental health systems. Um, so Emily, thank you for orchestrating this. And I look forward to continuing to be able to learn from you all as well. Yeah, if people had a specific question in the future, could they email you? Would that be a hundred percent? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks everybody. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bow out now and leave you guys to your, uh, you know, whatever comes next in your own cycle here. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. All right. Thank you all for being here and asking great questions. And I love hearing how different people interpret this work. So if you are in our trauma, uh, like the principles of trauma session that goes on after this, we're going to log out and log back into the other one. I was just worried there'd be, it'd be a weird transition. So if you, if you go to that link um, that we have, we'll, we'll switch over to there, but everybody else have a great uh, rest of your Saturday. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. Bye.